Hi, Don Forsythe here again. We're closing in on our final segment of uh, this analysis of the inclusion and identity within groups. Uh, we've already talked uh, at length about the need to belong, uh, the negative impact of, of exclusion on people. We've also talked about the difference between individualism and collectivism as ideologies and overall orientations that people have. Our final topic in this particular segment is social identity theory, which is a fascinating and very rich theoretical perspective. It's a fascinating one. The idea that although, and particularly in part because of individualism, convinces us that we are unique individuals and our personal characteristics come from our, our traits, our qualities, our previous life experiences. Social identity theory uh, reminds us that much of our answer to the question, who am I, uh, is based on our group memberships. Suggesting, in fact, that as we change groups, as we move from one group to another, as we abandon membership in, in one social category, even and move to a different social category, um, our group membership isn't the only thing that's changing our actual identity is changing, that our self undergoes change because the self uh, is, in, is su substantially influenced by group memberships. So our topics, so I get this to work. Hmm. Social identity theory, motivation, and social identity. The theory has roots in both psychology and sociology. Um, Charles Cooley, for example, uh, early sociologist, uh, talked about the, the we within each one of us, uh, that who we are changes over time depending upon the groups that we belong to. George Herbert Mead, the, the symbolic interactionist, talked about the self as a process which undergoes change through social interaction that we define who we are and partly control who we are by negotiating our interactions with others. Um, but probably most recently, the, the greatest influence comes from the European tradition in social psychology, Henri Teschfel, uh, John Turner, other investi investigators in France and in England, um, developed social identity theory to uh, account for certain phenomena that they had observed. For example, they were interested in the, the basic situation um, where one individual encounters another individual. Uh, this was their minimal group, intergroup situation, they called it. Uh, their, their initial goal was to try to understand conflict, you know, why one group comes into conflict with another group. And so they set up the most minimal situation possible, just as a baseline, to identify the starting point for intergroup perceptions. And what they would do is they bring together groups of individuals and arbitrarily classify them into two different groups. And I do mean arbitrarily classify them. The distinction between group A and group B was not based on anything meaningful. It could have been obviously random, in fact. Being a member of group A, none of the members of group A shared any characteristics that distinguished them from group B. And then they're going to add additional elements to the situation to see when conflict began to arise. Uh, but they never needed to, uh, because conflict began, discrimination began uh, almost, well, immediately. As soon as two groups came into existence, uh, the one group saw the other group members as outsider, outsiders and began to uh, treat them in less positive ways, even though the distinction between the groups was arbitrary. They tried to understand this, and as they explored it, they identified two key psychological processes that seemed to create uh, this distinction between groups, categorization and identification. So social categorization, individuals automatically classify themselves into groups. Uh, and of course, we think about this in terms of, of stereotypes. For example, when you encounter a person who's a member of another group, you tend to... Uh, make assumptions about what characteristics they may have. And the concept of stereotyping and subsequent discrimination has been around for a long time, but Tashvall and Turner emphasize that we don't just simply stereotype other people, we apply these stereotypes to ourselves as well. 
And so we recognize we are members of particular groups and that these groups have certain shared common characteristics and that therefore we ourselves have these socially shared characteristics. So people don't just classify other people into groups but themselves as well. So they categorize and they remember that they're a member of a group. People in my group, which I'm a member of, have these qualities. And eventually they decide that they themselves have these qualities as well. And they refer to that as social identification. So they self-stereotype. Uh, they take these qualities as their own. They also engage in a process known as depersonalization. So they no longer see themselves as, as unique um, an individual, but instead having the characteristics of a group. Uh, this image here illustrates this. These three individuals have become depersonalized. They have all become part of a group. Uh, this fourth individual with the frown on his face. He's looking at them as members of multiple groups and he doesn't really belong to the group. So he hasn't accepted social identification with the group. The implication of this is that the group becomes represented in the self. And this is sometimes shown in Venn diagrams where the self is completely independent from the group. But over time, the self and the group begin to merge. And this is the greatest level of inclusion of the group within the self or in contrast, the inclusion of the self within the group based on Steve Wright and Linda Trope's diagrammatic approach. Another approach which is, which is pretty well known is Luton and Crocker's analysis of the collective self-esteem scale. So as we talked earlier, according to the sociometer model that self-esteem is derived from your group membership, they suggest that the value placed on your groups also determines your, your self-esteem. So if you are a member of a group uh, that's not socially valued by others, it's possible once you self-stereotype as a member of the group that your self-esteem may drop as well. Crocker and her colleagues have identified, in fact, four different forms of this collective self-esteem in their inventory uh, membership, private, public, and identity self-esteem. This research does suggest, however, that even individuals who are members uh, of groups which are not highly esteemed in a particular culture and therefore might be at risk to experience low collective self-esteem um, generally have relatively high self-esteem um, that the group provides them, bolsters their self-esteem overall. Other processes that have been explored by social identity theorists is probably the most significant one is the in-group, out-group bias. Uh, it, it is the idea that in order to uh, maintain your self-esteem, you have to positively appraise your group. So you, you want to feel like you're the best member of your particular group, but that your group is better than other groups. And, and that leads to the in-group, out-group bias. So going back, in fact, to the original Henri and Tajville minimal in a group situation, Right away, you see the tendency to engage in an in-group, out-group tendency. The members of group A believe they were better than the members of group B and vice versa, even though the, the distinction between group A and group A was based on completely arbitrary factors. A related process is basking in reflected glory, sometimes summarized as berging, uh, in which individuals will stress their association with successful groups even though they're not really members of those particular groups. So fans of sports teams, for example, they're not actually on those teams. Um, they, they might admire those teams and they might cheer for those teams, but they're not members of those teams. And yet when those teams succeed, they often mention their association with those groups and they experience very positive psychological and emotional consequences following a team victory rather than a failure. Social creativity is the process where if our group fails relative to another group or seems to have lower status relative to another group on one dimension, group members tend to find something else that the group is better at than, than the other group. So for example, if two teams compete and one succeeds and the other fails, uh, the failing group might say, well, we may have lost the game, but we played more fairly, uh, for example or we made sure that everyone played. We didn't just play our best players. We had a chance to have everyone play. So in a sense, we're a fairer group, even though we lost. Stereotype threat is also related to social identity processes. It is the idea that if you're a member of a group 
which is a stereotyped group, um, and you are in the presence of out-group members who may be applying those stereotypes to you, that it could lead to anxiety uh, when you perform and undermine your, your performance. So, be, so these stereotypes become self-fulfilling prophecies. So the example of that might be uh, applied to, to women leaders, uh, an, a, a woman who finds herself in a group situation where she must lead uh, a group, an all-male group, uh, may believe as she is doing her work that those males are viewing her in a stereotyped way and that they expect her to be more socio-emotional rather than task-focused, um, knowing she's being possibly judged negatively, as the stereotypes suggest. Um, may cause her to become distracted from the work she needs to do and her performance may actually deteriorate. And that's the result of the stereotype threat. Social mobility is, is the final social identity process that you sometimes see in groups. Uh, people aren't necessarily locked into the groups permanently. They recognize the group may not be for them. Uh, they may not wish to be uh, stereotyped by out-group members. And if it's a group that they can leave, they might do so. Uh, in the case of the case study group that we examined, there were, there were many members of the group who did not like the high level of collectivism which the group required, and they didn't be like being judged by others on the basis of those characteristics. Um, there were individuals who, who wanted to be accorded heroic status for the work that they did with that particular group. But the group would never grant them um, that status. Uh, those individuals eventually became dissatisfied with membership in the peak search and rescue team and sought membership elsewhere. Social identity theory then, it's a complex theory that recognizes that our sense of self is based on personal identity as well as a social, more collective identity. Personal identity is based on things like exclusion, inclusion in the group and the achievements you may have, your positive characteristics. Social identity is tied more to group level achievements, that you favor your group and that you reject the out group. All of these processes, both personal identity and social identity, combine to, to lead to increased self esteem. Although research has not really verified some of these connections, uh, particularly for out group rejection, uh, in group favoritism does tend to be linked to self esteem and is a stronger tendency than out group rejection. So it's not clear if uh, saying bad things about the out-group actually bolsters the in-group member's self-esteem. That wraps up our analysis of uh, inclusion and identity in groups. Um, thank you for joining me.